Welcome to Between the Lines, a sports betting podcast for DraftKings.com. I'm your host, Eric Rosenthal, and with me today is Will Appleby. What's up? And the man who just went to the Toronto Raptors victory parade and is enjoying it a bit, I'm sure, Gary and Thorne. Hey, guys. So I keep going to you first for like every podcast because your Raptors keep winning and now they had, got the chance to celebrate their championship. You went to the parade. How was it? What did you see? And they saw Andrew Wiggins Raptors jersey. I just want to know what went down. Yeah, that was uh, that was probably the low point of the day. Um, yeah, I guess this will be the last time. Uh, this is technically the last thing the Raptors can do, I guess, for the summer. I think they pick 59th in the draft. So they're probably not going to have too much of an impact on that. Uh, although if Kawhi resigns, I'll have immediate instantaneous reaction to that. He'll be on in the uh, the dinosaur costume we saw. Yeah, a lot of, lot of dinosaur costumes. Although there seems to be – I don't know if this is a supply-demand thing, uh, but a lot of people – might just think Tyrannosauruses or Raptors in this city. A lot of, a lot of T-Rex yeah. costumes and T-Rex balloons that <laughs> people think pass off as Raptors stuff. Uh, inaccurate, to say the least. We've got to do some dinosaur cramming. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't know. The dudes who made Jurassic Park apparently didn't get the look of the Raptors right anyway. So who, who even knows at this point? But no, it was, it was a lot of fun. Uh, I think there were you know, various reports, whether it was 1.5 million or 2 million people, uh, but yeah, the, the parade was delayed apparently like three hours because there were just not enough barricades to contain the people from spilling out in front of the buses. Uh, so, like just weird dance parties taking place. Uncle Dennis chanting five more years, uh, pretty much everything you could want from the afternoon. I, I didn't know about the Uncle Dennis part. That's, that's some big news, right? He, he runs Kawhi's life apparently. Apparently. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we'll see how that all breaks down. But then you had uh, Kawhi's sister and Kawhi's cousin on Instagram talking about the Lakers with eyeballs. Apparently that's not even Kawhi's cousin. Oh, is it not? That's the, yeah. So, yeah, who even, who even knows at this point? Oh, but uh, I will say of, of every player, apparently Norman Powell got so drunk he couldn't stand up anymore, which at the very least, then you can't really have an impact on the rest of the day because you're just lying down. Uh, Marc Gasol really wanted to fall off a bus. Uh, that dude pounded a bottle of rosé within the first five minutes of the parade, uh, was never not drinking, and was in. I've never seen Marc Gasol show that much emotion uh, or have fun. But I guess when you tend to your vegetable garden 11 of the 12 months of the year and you have a little bit of alcohol in your system, it hits you really hard. But Marc Gasol, clear MVP of yesterday's festivities in Toronto. It's, it's a he was probably like plus 2000 for MVP of the parade I would have guessed never would have seen that coming but uh, th- that's fun to hear and man it feels like there's like no time to enjoy that championship we went from that to the Anthony Davis trade that just happened we'll get into that and then all of a sudden we have the NBA draft coming up which there's a tons of props in the DK Sportsbook that we're going to focus on makes try to make some money and look at all the angles on, on who you should bet on and who you shouldn't but doesn't it feel like the season just ended? Like this is way too fast. Well, I, I think you spoke to that before. I think it's a good thing though, because I mean, the NFL like it feels like you know two other sports play entire seasons between the end of the season and the draft. So I mean, like as weird as it is, I kind of like it. Like just get right to it. Don't waste any time. I don't know. Are you are you on board, Gary? And I think I need a breather. Like it, everything is just happening nonstop for the NBA. I want to talk about other sports. Yeah, I mean, I guess this is kind of part of the spacing out the league to try to entice guys not to rest, uh, which I, I don't know if a guy who coined the term load management winning the NBA championship and finals MVP is going to help that. Sorry, Adam Silver. But uh, it is pretty compressed. But I think this is the way the NBA wants it. Like, there's not going to be a single point this season, especially with, uh, you know, the, the Basketball World Cup happening in August, too. Like, there, there's not going to be a point until maybe, like, we get into the real nitty-gritty of preseason. Like – you know, week three, uh, right leading up to the start of the NFL season, that the NBA is not going to be like mentioned within the first ten minutes of Sports Center. Like that's that's kind of got to be the dream if if you're running the NBA right now. June pretty much is their month, so I think they like to maximize that. I mean, you see, they moved free agency into June. Like, I mean, only a couple of days, but um, they really like to maximize this dead part of the summer. I think, and I think they just want to get right to it and keep the talk going. Yeah, I guess we're going to keep it going. Let's start with a few baseball things, Gary, because I know a lot of people are going to be focused on the draft and we can the rest of the podcast will be pretty much NBA focused. But I know you had some MLB props that you wanted to give out for today. 
Yeah, uh, I had two props in particular I like for Tuesday night slate, and they both kind of have to do with starting pitchers and strikeout props. Um, one, probably on the more obvious side of the spectrum, even though it's a pretty big number, uh, Justin Verlander, eight and a half strikeouts tonight. Um, he's only actually reached this number in five of his 15 starts. So there's a reason it's plus 120 in the DK Sportsbook, but it's an enticing plus 120. Uh, you look at the Cincinnati Reds roster, uh, first and foremost, they've been awful offensively so far in June. Uh, and that can really help Verlander in terms of just length. Uh, I would expect to see him pitch into the seventh inning, maybe even pitch into the eighth inning. And at that point, we're talking about someone with a career K per nine above one strikeout per inning. So if he's getting to the eighth, this prop gets a lot easier. But in terms of handedness constructs, there's a very good chance the Reds are going to have three natural left-handed batters in the lineup tonight, along with switch hitting catcher Tucker Barnhart. And then the pitcher's spot with this game being in the National League. Going back to the start of 2018, Justin Verlander has struck out 39.1% of the left-handed batters he has faced. And that was a big reason he struck out 15 guys in his last start against Milwaukee. They ran out of lineup with five left-handed bats against Verlander. It's, it seems like it's what you should be doing against a power right-handed pitcher, but it really doesn't work to that script. Uh, so I think with the amount you of... You saw what Scherzer did to them. Yeah, exactly. Like, I, I just think that eight and a half at plus money is is really enticing for someone of Verlander's caliber, especially if there's going to be that many left-handed bats in the lineup. And on the opposite end of the spectrum, uh, Adrian Sampson uh, of the Texas Rangers is kind of interesting. He's got a very conservative prop tonight of four and a half strikeouts. Uh, it's at plus 128 to go over that number, which is fair. I mean, I don't think the average person even knows who Adrian Sampson is. Hasn't had the best season, but I will say in June, he's made three starts and his strikeout rate has spiked above 27% in those three starts. And a big reason for that is his slider usage from May to June has gone from roughly 27% to 36%. And that pitch has a 25.3% whiff rate so far this season. If he's figured out how to use that pitch and especially use that pitch to left-handed bats, which is going to be massive against the Indians tonight, uh, I think that prop is too low. Like, I, I just think that number should be five and a half. Uh, it's four and a half. So I'm going to try and take advantage. Yeah, those are both two value props that you get plus money on, which makes a lot of sense. If you go one and one on those two props, you win money. And I think that there's some value on, on both sides of those. I want to talk a little bit about baseball, about our picks last week. And uh, Will, you came in third. Garyan, second, plus $130. But I like how third. everybody homered in that game. We picked three <laughs> different people. They all homered. When we we should have we should have picked one. guys on both sides of the game like Eric did. That was that was the secret key to success. Well, I, I told you that there was going to be a ton of at bats, and it's all running together. That game finished sixteen to twelve. The game I said everyone was going to hit a homer in, and and they uh, led eleven to five in the ninth inning. Like, like let's not forget that. And it ended sixteen to twelve. Yeah, you would you would have hit two props instead of one if they just held on to that lead. We all would have hit a prop. I know. Yeah, I had plus plus. Uh, 425 on Blackman uh, and plus and so yeah, 550, plus, I believe. Yeah, had a home run and win. Mm. It's up on your screen now for people who are watching on video. Uh, but I got lucky with, you know, I, not lucky. Machado had a home run in the game and they won at plus 500. And obviously, the Nationals came through for me. But I wanted to talk about Coors Field because it, it comes up in daily fantasy sports too. And a lot of people, you know, play DFS on DraftKings, especially baseball right now. And Coors Field, people talk about the park factors. But I think they're just really underrated. I know, you know, Coors Field's 4,125 feet higher than anywhere else. Chase Field, second highest. But I think people under it, underestimate park factors in baseball, especially somewhere like Coors. Yes, the over-under might be 11.5 instead of 7.5 if the game is at Petco Park. But you just never, ever see the kind of offensive performances you just saw in Colorado, in Petco, or, or many other stadiums. You saw it was 16 to 12. You don't even see it in Coors. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I mean, Charlie Blackman was setting records. Everybody was. That series went 16 to 12, 14 to 8, 14 to 13, and 8 to 14. Those were the four games. And it's not even the same sport. It's absurd. It's a- <laughs> well, I, think, I, I do think one thing you have to think about, though, is just the caliber of those two rotations is – it probably speaks a lot to um, – I mean, obviously, Coors and, and, and the altitude is going to play – a major role in those scores, but we're talking about two teams that 
just even coming into the season, like when everyone was excited about the Padres because they went out and signed Machado. Uh, and then we found out they were going to call up to Tease, And it was like, wow, this, this lineup kind of starting to resemble like a contender. But one quick glance at that rotation, you're like, oh, Joey Lucchese is your ace? Okay, um, that might be a little hard to stomach. And Colorado's in a pretty similar boat. Like even Herman Marquez, who I, I love, um, his numbers just turn into a dumpster fire as soon as he has to pitch in cores. Um, you know, it's, there's only so much you can survive. Like I think if, if the Rockies had the Astros staff, maybe this wouldn't be that big a deal, but the fact they also have just a sub average staff, same with the Padres, like you were asking for trouble in this series. You are. And the point I'm going to make is Joey Lucchese. I watched him pitch last night through seven shutout innings. He's not playing the same sport when he's pitching in course. And I think people who game log watch and look at, you know, have recency bias on how a player is doing. I saw a stat. Fernando Tatis is 10 for his last 19 with three triples and two doubles and a homer. It was all in course. <laughs> yeah, it's all in course. Like those are fake. Those are video game numbers that aren't real. But I'm sure a Brewers fan who turned, tuned in is like, oh my God, Tatis is the greatest player in the history of the sport, maybe as a rookie. Um, but I think we need to look at park effects more than we do and, and realize that a lot of these numbers, especially earlier in the season, are not as real as you'd like to believe. Um, and I think there's, you can take advantage of that and knowing that sometimes these numbers aren't real and you can get value, whether it's away from cores or if there's a, a player with strong handedness splits in a certain park. Just look into that and I think always be aware of stats in baseball are not like stats in basketball where they're pretty, you know, yeah, there might be a higher pace at Oracle or something, but it's basically the same sport, and in baseball it's not. And uh, thank you to Scherzer and the Nationals for making me go from $500 to plus 440 overall at $940, and I'll, I'll take that win. Appreciate it, Gary. Yeah, that one, was, uh, that one was pretty easy. But here's the thing with Coors. Like, I, I agree with you. I, I think um, – and, and here's maybe where betting and gambling differs from daily fantasy in terms of – in a daily fantasy sense – you obviously want to play batters at Coors Field, but you have to factor in variance in a tournament setting where gambling, it's you against the book. So you just do whatever you want to do. You do what you think is going to win. Uh, so you don't have to worry about thinking the over is going to hit at Coors. Sure, the odds will be adjusted to the amount of people betting that, but it's, it's not like you have to get variance in your bet. So I, I think from a gambling perspective, the couple things I would look at specific to Coors – uh, when it comes to opposing pitchers or even the Rockies' own pitchers at a game at Coors, uh, but opposing pitchers specifically, the Rockies are very set up to crush left-handed pitching. Um, you Cole know, Hamels begs to differ, by the way. Sorry? Cole Hamels begs to differ. Just wanted to say that. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. But uh, just between Story, uh, between Desmond this season, Arenado obviously has some of the gaudiest numbers in like MLB history when he faces a left-handed pitcher. Obviously, a lot of that has to do with cores, um, but even David Dahl and Charlie Blackman have acceptable splits within left on left matchups. So I think when you do see a lefty on the mound, I'm always more inclined to, to, to lean towards the over and just guys who have the inability to negate contact. Like if you have someone who's got a single digit swinging strike rate or a contact rate above 82, 83%, that's really when Coors comes into play. Like the only two ways to negate Coors Field's uh, uh, just impact on the game is to keep the ball on the ground or to limit contact altogether. Uh, and there are certain pitchers who just can't do that. So I think you have to look for archetypes when it comes to this kind of stuff because you're right. It's it's still daunting to see an 11 and a half game total and say, yeah, I think 12 runs will be scored in this game. Yeah, and I think also last thing is live betting on some of these Coors games there were some of the best opportunities to bet I've seen in a long time in the DK Sportsbook live on this course game. It just, these bullpens couldn't get it done. You could tell game after game after game, it was going way over. The live lines weren't adjusting in time. And I think those are kind of opportunities where you can see, look, this is not normal. Something strange is happening and, and take advantage of it. Keep betting the over because these games were going into the 20s. Uh, 25 runs wasn't out of the question at any point, but the over under wouldn't the live over under wouldn't really change that much. It would go up by two runs. Then you just take advantage and it's double single double Homer. And then the, it would jump by four runs and you just bet it again. it was, well, I think something you need to keep in mind too, is the, like Gary and said, it's the quality of pitchers that were pitching in that series. It wasn't great. I mean, Cole Hamels went in there and dominated. 
Like this isn't the Larry Walker era era Coors Field. So, you know, you got to keep it in mind, like a good pitcher like Max Scherzer or somebody like that will cruise in there and shouldn't have much trouble. They're not going to, Scherzer's not going to go in there, uh, in there and give up nine runs. So, I mean, you got to keep that in mind too. Yeah, exactly. Well, I, I heard a stat, the ball and on an average home run, the ball will travel 33 feet farther at a ball hit at Coors than hit at Petco. So wow. Max Scherzer probably doesn't matter because that's going to be a ground ball or a strikeout. But guys who give up contact, the Gary mentioned, that is really where you can get into trouble and just get destroyed and have a 16 to 12 baseball game like we did. Um, to the NBA, we have to talk Anthony Davis trade. It has now made the Lakers the favorite to win the NBA title plus 350 in the DK That's sports. Such a knee jerk reaction. Yeah. Is it though? They have Anthony you have three Davis. players on the roster. Well, LeBron five, I think. James. Kyle Kuzma, and don't forget Alex Caruso, the legend. Oh, the man, the myth, the legend. Yeah, he uh, somehow he's going to have more NBA championships than Chris Paul at this rate. But I well, don't know. That's, not, that's the- not exactly a challenge. It's Chris Paul. <laughs> don't slander Chris Paul on between the lines, please. Lakers are plus three. James Harden's like, go ahead and slander Chris Paul. It's fine. <laughs> so the thing is, if they get somebody like Kawhi plus three fifty, it's just okay. outrageous. Like I, this is the thing. Like I, I know there's there's contrasting reports, and we haven't heard whether or not Davis is waving the trade kicker. But Kawhi's not, not signing kidding. a one and one with Los Angeles for twenty two million dollars. Yeah. Like it's it's just not happening. Like again, we there's there's a reason they're favorites, and it's because you know the good people running the DraftKings sportsbook realize that people want to bet on the Lakers. Uh, Will could probably tell you better than anyone on the planet about LeBron stands and how they operate. Yep. Like, I, I don't think this is a reflect. Like, I, I think saying that they are the favorites to win the NBA title for next season is only true in the sense that they have the lowest odds. Uh, I think the odds, though, are a reflection of just the betting structure and the betting wants of the world. Like, and also that they have two stars right now. Like, other teams are going to acquire these players who are free agents. Like, I, I just think this, there's there's no value right now betting on the Lakers. You, you, you could not pay me to bet on the Lakers. It's a sucker bet. I mean, honestly, it's like, I think you just hit on it. Like, they're trying to get people to bet on it. You know, they're kind of trying to bait them in versus saying, okay, yeah, they're the clear favorite. They're like, oh, look, here are shiny things. The Lakers have two toys. Come bet on them. So. Yeah, well, I think, Eric, like, you had you had a good point, and I, I don't know what this line has kind of uh, morphed into at this point, but. You know, there, there are a couple of those, like, niche championship bets through free agency you can find on the book where, like, if Kyrie Irving is to sign with the Lakers, what would their championship odds be? And the bets only come through if Kyrie actually signs. Like, that might not be a terrible way to attack the Lakers if those options are still available to you. But, yeah, like, again, I, I am not a smart enough man to understand the cap, but, like, I trust Bobby Marks, uh, and from what I'm hearing – they don't have that max slot unless they push this trade back past July 30th or, you know, he waves that trade kicker, which I don't know if Anthony Davis is necessarily going to do. So uh, we'll see how it breaks down. But as constantly constructed, I don't think they bring in like this third massive piece that everyone's expecting them to. And it's not going to be Leonard. And Woj said this morning that he was focusing on the Raptors and the Clippers. So that should make Eric happy. That does make me happy. I'm very glad to hear that. Um, the cap situation, look, they can work it out. I trust Bobby Marks too. Him and I have had disagreements on some of this stuff in the past and I turned out to be correct, but there's all these reports, but look, if it came down to it, if Kawhi Leonard is not going to happen or Kemba Walker, Kyrie Irving said, I want to come to LA for the max. Look, the Lakers offer one more pick swap in 2024 or whatever it is to get the Pelicans to wait until July 30th to make the deal happen. And it, that's just the truth of the situation. If Kyrie Irving said, I want to be in LA for a max deal, they'll figure it out. There's no way they won't trade Alex Caruso or if they have to deal Kyle Kuzma for a future first round pick to make it happen. Like, trust me, it'll happen. Um, again, I don't think it will, will be Kawhi. And I'm glad to hear that report. But the news that, like, also the Clippers said they wouldn't trade Shy for Anthony Davis was just a ridiculous statement. If Kawhi says, hey, I'm coming to the Clippers, all you got to do is trade your rookie point guard in, in Shy for. Anthony Davis straight up. There's no way the, the Clippers yeah, say no. Don't hey, you think that's more of a, So, I mean. Yeah, but I, I almost think, like, look, I don't want to give Danny Ainge any credit because I think he has screwed up a situation that 
few could even have dreamed of three, four years ago. Uh, his, his aversion to trade even like Terry Rozier, who was untouchable in the trade that like got the Raptors surge of Baca. Like some of the players that he wouldn't trade Terry Rozier for are insane. Um, and, and they vary across the board. But I do think with the Gilgis Alexander thing, I would almost think in just my trust in the Clippers front office and, and how much they know what they're doing. I think they just understood, look, we, we can't come up with a package, a reasonable package, a package that we would be comfortable giving up for Anthony Davis that would come even close to the desperation that Rob Polinka is reeking of right now. And it, it yeah. played out like that package they gave up was, it, it made the Nets package for the Celtics big three look bashful. Um, I think if you're the Clippers, you understand that we're not getting this done. How about instead of alienating our players like LeBron did for the second half of last season, we kind of give shy a little confidence boost and say, Hey, look, we're not moving you for Anthony Davis, knowing full well that they weren't going to move him or get Anthony Davis anyway. So you might as well just tell that to Gilgis Alexander to make him feel better. That's a great point. I completely agree with everything you said right there. It makes a lot of sense because in reality, if the Pelicans knocked on the door and said straight up, this is our offer. Everyone knows that happens immediately, but yeah, you give the guy a confidence boost and you kind of know you're not going to give out all these pick swaps in 2023, 2024, 2025, like the Lakers did, because you never know. You could be the best team in the league at the Lakers. You can make the NBA finals. And we just saw with the Warriors, you know, you can have two catastrophic injuries with an Achilles and an ACL in two nights. And then, and this is Anthony Davis. Let's emphasize that it's Anthony Davis has gone to the locker room is tweeted 50 times a year you know, every season. So I just think he has a small bladder. Have we explored that? that you know what? To we have it. A lot? The Paul Pierce news that when he <laughs> left in the wheelchair, he had, we don't need to hear about that other business to take care of. I actually wouldn't be shocked if it one day came out. Anthony Davis just was using the restroom all these times. Cause he has played over 70 games. I think three years in a row, it's been more durable than people realize. He just goes to the locker room constantly for, I don't know if he has good insurance or what, but he gets MRIs like. Six. Well, you can talk to Chris Paul about his insurance needs. So there's that. That's but, a good uh, thing Chris Paul can do. I think with the Lakers at plus 350, like I, I understand that this is not just a reflection of the trade. This is also a reflection of the Warriors possibly being down two of their franchise players uh, for, if not all, when it comes to Kevin Durant, most of the 2019 season when it comes to Clay Thompson. But you know, you look at these other teams in the Western Conference, like, I know there's a lot of uncertainty in Houston right now, but if they keep that court together, and I know they've explored, like, getting rid of Clint Capella and possibly opening up some cap space for some other options in that aspect, uh, the Nuggets, you would assume the Nuggets just get better this season. Like, they have a young core. They're probably going to expand upon it. Maybe Michael Porter Jr. is really good. Uh, yeah. I, I still think there's Titans in the West. Uh, and maybe West we go very deep. Like, I think people forget how deep the West yeah. is. Like, I mean, I, I like my Thunder team and they may, they, you know, they may get lucky to be a top five team in the West. So the yeah, West like, I, I just think there's so many obstacles in the West still, uh, that we, we just don't, we might be overreacting to this whole thing. And look, like there's already been estimations that Clay could possibly be back by like January. I'm not saying he's going to be full strength, but I, I think the juxtaposition from the ACL injury to the Achilles injury maybe made us look at this ACL thing and go, oh, man, that's, that's just as bad as the Achilles. No, it's not. People come back from ACL tears all the time. Like, I think Clay's going to be fine. And if you can get 30 regular season games out of Clay, like, there, there's, still, there's still a chance, like, the Lakers get a two seed and have to play the seven seed Warriors in the first round of the playoffs. Like, there's so much that Imagine can go Imagine the one eight matchup and the eight is the Warriors and they take out the, the one Lakers that, oh, the chaos. Man, I would, I would love to see that. I would love to chaos. see that. And I think it, it's very real. Like the Warriors are plus 800 to win the title on this DK Sportsbook right now. Are we going to look back and go like, what in the world were we doing making the Warriors plus 800? Like Clay, who cares about the regular season? Who, Iggy can take a bunch of games off. Clay will be rested and healthy come playoff time. Maybe Durant makes a miraculous return in the playoffs. Like, are, are we going to look back and think plus 800 for the Warriors is just it's crazy after the five year? Uh, run to the finals i think curry goes westbrook post durant mode next year because okay. i mean they're going to need him too anyway i don't know if he's going to put up the rebounds and assist numbers but i mean i think he's going to you know average some very gaudy scoring you know numbers maybe he you know he does the hard and averages like 38 or 
you know, 37, 38, 39 a game. Uh, whether that gets them wins or not, I mean, I think is the real question. I think plus 800 makes sense. I don't think you can safely say like, oh, yeah, they're definitely going to win the title. You know, there's too much of that roster in flux. But, I mean, yeah, I mean, it could easily backfire. You know, I wouldn't be surprised at all to see them come back and win. I think the big thing with the Warriors is just figuring out what they're going to do with Durant. Like, you know, I think I think most Warriors fans would probably be happy if he if he signed the five year max. And, and I don't want to say you're giving up on 2019-20, but you'd be fine with that realizing you still have like another four years of this possible dynasty. Although what they do with Draymond next summer is, is obviously a very interesting wrinkle with all that because he'll want the max, too. Um, but if they don't re-sign Durant, like if there's another team out there and there's, there's probably 29 other teams out there willing to give Durant the max to have him sit on the bench for the entirety of next season. It, I'm not saying it's good if he leaves the Warriors, but it does open up $30 million in cap room for them to get the reinforcements and those secondary pieces they did not have against the Raptors. And if you've got like, if you bring in two solid rotation pieces, for that $30 million and add that to a core that probably by the playoffs will still be Steph Curry, Draymond Green, Clay Thompson, and Andre Iguodala. That's a really formidable group. So I would say plus 800 is fair as we're still on this side of free agency, but it's, it's super enticing. Yeah. As the way the cat mechanics work, it doesn't appear they'd be able to add anybody. If Durant did leave the one way they could maybe add some players, if they get a medical waiver for Kevin Durant, yeah. which I haven't seen the reports on that. It's unclear. We have to know about his injury um, and them being over the cap, how that all work. But they, they can't use that cap space to add anybody as far as I know. But um, there's always a way to add somebody. There's always a veteran who gets bought out uh, and you just get that fifth or sixth guy to make a championship run. And, you know, the David West of that year, whoever it may be, uh, is definitely possible. And we've said this before. People are always underestimating that organization. They're going to do something. They're not just going to sit there and let the roster fall apart. They're going to do something. The question is what that something is. Yeah. This and there's still just like solid teams in the West too. Like even teams we haven't mentioned yet. Like San Antonio is probably not going to be fantastic, but you know, they get full season of Derek White. Uh, they get their backcourt to be, you know. DeJounte Murray. DeJounte Murray. Don't forget him. Back. The Jazz, like the Jazz have been in heavy, heavy rumors to add D'Angelo Russell if Kyrie Irving ends up in Brooklyn. Like, or Conley. Or, or Conley. Conley. Like that's a, that's a really interesting team if they get a point guard of that caliber to pair with Donovan Mitchell and Rudy Gobert. Like there's just so much that could happen in the West. The fact that a team that as currently constituted has four players is plus 350. Like that's that's crazy. It is. And, you know, a lot of this is going to be decided on draft night, Thursday night. And we're going to get to some, a lot of those props because obviously it's all about who gets drafted. Zion, the presumed number one pick, potential superstar. But what trades are going to happen? You mentioned Conley. Will, he could be shopped. I think there's a very good chance Conley gets traded on draft night. And we'll see what these teams do, who makes moves to trade for the future and or tries to win now or tries to win for the future. And I think teams like the Rockets, the Jazz, you just mentioned. A lot of teams are seeing this is the first time in is it nine years we've had of clear favorites before the season. We had the uh, the LeBron four years with the Miami Heat uh, in the big three there, and then five years of just the Warriors dynasty where they didn't win every year, but they were the clear favorite going in. It was who was going to take them down, and now we have the most open year I think in ten years. So we'll see what teams do on draft night. I don't think the Warriors were the clear favorite in 2015 though. That first year of that run, but yeah, that's that, true. That's true. That was that was probably a bit surprising. I will say maybe, it's maybe. it's so unclear right now. Uh, I gotta razz the DraftKings uh, playbook a little bit. They've since corrected this prop, but I was gonna call them out today. They have a uh, sort of a geography based who will win the NBA championship in 2019-20, and it was a California based team, a New York based team, or any other state. And I was about to be like, well, currently no state holds the NBA championship. So uh, you might want to revise that prop a little bit, which they have. It is now any other team, not any other state. But uh, shouts to Canada once again. Shouts to the Raptors. I'm never going to shut up about it. If you don't see Gary and coming back next week, you know why now. So. That, was a, that was a great, uh, a good catch because I would have probably done the same thing. Even though Toronto just won the, uh, the championship. What's funny is uh, I, I caught – uh, just real quick, I caught on ABC uh, right after the NBA Finals. They were asking people what they think about Canada becoming the 51st state. And uh, everyone was like, oh, it's, it's good news. You know, we're, we're happy to he hear it. And uh, I thought Gary might get a kick of that. 
kick out of that. But to the <sighs> NBA draft, let's not even bother with the first couple picks, in my opinion. Like we know it's going to be Zion Williamson number one. Will is there any possible ability in the world that that isn't the case? Oh, Zion's gonna be number one. I mean, we, okay. we've hit this over and over and over and over. And as much as I would just like to ship all of my $500 on Zion going number one and come back with $500 and one cent next week to be really <laughs> safe, uh, Zion's going number one. I think number two is where a, a few questions get open. Everybody assumes Jaws going number two, and I think that's a safe assumption. Uh, the rumor now is that the Pelicans are interested in trying to trade up to number two, not for Ja, but for R.J. Barrett. Uh, how much credence you put into that rumor, I, I don't know. I mean, I, supposedly the Knicks don't want to move from three, which is why the Pelicans would have to do that uh, to jump ahead of them. Uh, I think it would be really funny to see the Pelicans move up and take R.J. Barrett, and then the Knicks still pass on John Moran. Uh, that's always a possibility. It is the Knicks. Uh, I, I think two and three become interesting. You know, the safe assumption is that, you know, they're going to take jaw number two, uh, move Conley somewhere, probably. Uh, the Knicks take RJ Barrett at three. And then there's, you know, then it becomes a little more open. Yeah. But um, for me, like, I feel like it's just almost too predictable. It feels like something be- after Zion has to happen. Like, I think, the, I think the really interesting thing, though, like you said, if, if something like that happens where it, it was that that third pick seemed like the moving piece a month ago, and now it seems like that four pick is the moving piece. And if the Pelicans want to use that to jump up to two to get Barrett, and whether that's for basketball reasons or whether that's they want to already start enticing Zion to like sign the max deal four years from now. Probably that. Um, There's the real reason right there. It's probably that, right? So I, I don't know whatever their intentions are, but you would think, like we've said before, Mike Conley seems like he's not destined to start this season in Memphis. And that's fair for all parties involved. I think if you're Memphis, you have to walk out of this draft with the point guard of the future, or at least if you're the GM or the president or the owner specifically, uh, you'd be putting pressure on your GM and your president to be like, we need to walk out of this draft with fans knowing who our starting point guard is this year. And we don't want that guy to be DeLon Wright, all respected DeLon Wright. But and it sets off this weird chain of events. If they do move up to two, the Pelicans, and take Barrett, you would assume the Knicks, although like Will said, the Knicks always come with the caveat of they're the Knicks, you would assume they take Morant at three and thank their lucky stars that they get there. Then we've got this whole thing where Memphis now holds the fourth pick. I mean, do they take Garland at four? There's, I think Draft Express came out with a report uh, about like half an hour before we started filming this show that the Knicks are having Garland in for a last second workout tomorrow that Boston yeah, and Chicago and Minnesota yeah. are all looking straight up to the draft. Yeah. And we talked about this uh, uh, maybe a month, a month and a half ago when we were talking about who's interesting, who's an interesting name at number three. Um, and Garland was someone who we brought up just because yep. he's a dynamic playmaking point guard. Like those types of players always just open people's eyes and open the eyes of management and ownership because they just see dollar signs with those types of players. So um if something crazy, like if, if you're the kind of person who wants to bet on RJ Barrett being taken second overall, you might as well just bet Darius Garland over his prop too, because I think that's where the chain of events leads. What would be really amazing, I think, is if this trade goes down, you know, the Pelicans move to two, they take RJ Barrett, the Knicks still pass on Jaw and take, let's say, Darius Garland, and then the Grizzlies have Jaw in their lap at number four after just assumingly just giving him to the Knicks. Uh, that would just be too perfect. Yeah. Um, RJ under is plus 1400 and I'm going to take a few bones of my $500 and just take a shot on it, whether it happens or not. Um, it's an interesting dart throw. So. Yeah, we got the second overall pick uh, odds up on the board and Morant's minus 5,000. Barrett is plus 1200. The way to play this is if we can get over to the third overall pick, John Morant is plus 2,500 to go number three overall. So I think if you believe... Garland is plus 1600. So. Yes. If somehow you think Barrett's going to go two. I think the move is actually to bet Morant to go three number o- third overall at plus twenty five hundred. It's basically the same bet. I guess there's a chance that they pass on him at three. It just plus- RJ feels safer because you know if that trade happens, that's what's going. That's what they're doing. It's for RJ. Yeah. I mean, I don't buy it. Me being skeptical of the Knicks, like I just the Knicks could do literally anything. So yeah. I just I don't I buy it at all for a reason. 
But I mean, I feel like as weird as it is, if we're talking extreme scenarios, I feel like the RJ Barrett scenario is quote unquote safer than go, you know, trying to, you know, ride on the Knicks doing, you know, the right thing. Yeah. Again, I, I don't buy it at all. I think it goes the order we're expecting of Morant two and, and Barrett three. Uh, I think there's just a lot of rumors before the draft teams trying to get t- people to trade and, and make mistakes that help them out. But I do want to talk about some of the other odds. Um, number one being Cam Reddish over under seven and a half for his draft position. I really like him on the over. Um, you know, he had the in- injury in the tournament and that c- could have cost Duke a national title. Who knows with knee soreness, as he said, but um, I-, I think the, 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 the best pick for him is eight with Atlanta. And I don't really see a team. I think that's why it's set at seven and a half. So. Yeah. And I just don't see a team. I think Darius Garland obviously goes in the top seven now, especially with all these reports. And then you have one, you have the, the two fa- favorites, you know, you, you would assume Culver goes ahead of him. And there's also a chance that, you know, maybe it's Kobe White. Um, maybe it's just somebody completely off the board who goes ahead of him at number five or number six. And I, I don't know who that would be, but there's m- multiple options. I think Cam Reddish slips to at least eight. I could see him falling to 10 with Atlanta. Because I don't think anyone's in, in love with him. He had the hype coming into Duke. Um, had an okay season, but no one really believes that he's like a star. And, and I just don't see any team trading up for him in the top seven. Uh, yeah. I think there's a high probability he goes eight to Atlanta or even 10 to Atlanta. I mean, I you got to think Culver and DeAndre Hunter are probably locked in at four yeah. and five if everything goes as it goes as expected. I, yeah. I think Garland gets in there maybe at four now, uh, but Hunter, exactly. Hunter, he should go before Reddish. I'd be very surprised if he didn't. And then there's also just the possibility of any well, Pelicans aren't going to draft Garland if they're still at four because, I mean, they got, you know, Magic Johnston reincarnate according to his father in Lonzo Ball. So... You know, you got to think they would take Culver, then Hunter would go, then probably Garland, um, if everything goes as expected, which is, is never a guarantee anyway. So, yeah, but I, th- I think the Hunter before. things, the Hunter things, really interesting too, because um, even just between last night and tonight, we've seen some of Hunter's lines move, um, which I know there is some skepticism about him, um, but I, I think just to the extent he's been connected to Cleveland. And it seems like even even John Beeline like gushes about this guy. And I don't know how much of an impact he's going to have necessarily, but I I think more often than not in my head, DeAndre Hunter end up ends up in Cleveland. So whereas last night you would have had to bet, I think it was minus two hundred uh, for Hunter over pick four point five. Now you can get minus one ten on Hunter under pick five point five. Um, some of these trades would obviously complicate matters. If, if Garland is going to, if someone's going to trade up and move into the top five for Garland, that throws a wrench into this too, but all things being equal. And even if Garland does get taken at number four, I, I just think there's been way too much and way too many people connecting Hunter to Cleveland for their Hunter not- going fifth is plus plus one fifteen for what it's yeah. worth. So yeah, yeah I think and maybe and that might be the better bet because I, I don't know if, I don't know if someone trades up to four to take Hunter. Um, so I, I guess, yeah, maybe, maybe plus plus one fifteen for the fifth pick exactly is the better bet. Yeah. I think there's some value there and we know he's not going to go top three. There's, there's almost no chance of that. Just the question is, does he go four? and maybe we're giving too much credence to this Garland hype. I think he does go four in the end. Uh, Garland, uh, you know, played limited games. I think it was at four. Do you think the Pelicans would pass on Culver to take another point guard? Probably not, but. I just, that's what I mean. I just I think it's going to be Culver. I mean, I mean Culver- but there are te- like I think I think one team that really scares me in terms of the reports about who's looking to trade up is I, I think there's not only because maybe he's a little embarrassed about how he's handled these last couple of years, but if you're Danny Ainge, like you can't give out this level of max or or or, or not max contracts, but guaranteed contracts to first round picks. Like you know, Ainge wants to trade some of these first rounders. Yes, uh, so if he he's yeah, desperate- Orford just declined his option, so. Yeah. So that Boston would scare me a little bit just because they're obviously looking for point guard. Um, but and, that would require Ainge to actually do something. We know how we feel true. about that, actually that is, doing something. So. It does I, seem like if there was ever a situation where he was backed into a corner, like I don't think he wants to give out three guaranteed contracts, uh, especially in this draft class. Uh, so I, I'm sure Boston's going to do something. Yeah, probably trade for more draft picks. We forget he, he did trade out of the Markel Fultz number one spot, which is – an all-time great trade since we don't even know if Markel Fultz remembers how to shoot a basketball or what's going to happen with him at all. So, 
he did make a great trade in that situation and got Tatum, even if Tatum doesn't live up to. And he got out of Isaiah Thomas with that injury, for what it's worth. Exactly. Yeah. And um, signed the best coach in basketball, Brad Stevens. But we won't stick on that. And what other players? I'm going to mention Romeo Langford at under 16 and a half that I like. I just want you guys to throw out some other names to look out for in the NBA draft. Maybe just sleepers that you like on the basketball court in general or just good at betting angles in the DK sports. My league. guy, Cam and Gelly from the FSU, um, which I don't want to say the, but I'll just screw it, say it just to screw with the Ohio State guys. Um, under 22 and a half is something I like. Uh, the Celtics, you know, we just talked about them, are linked to taking him at 2022. 20, so, and I think he makes a lot of sense, especially with Horford, Horford opting out. Uh, his his odds are pretty nice. I think they're like plus 120. I can't remember off the top of my head. Plus 125. Uh, 125. Okay. That's something I like. Um, something I will be taking our part of my 500 and betting on is him going under. He was a very slept on player because he didn't start. Um, for Florida State, he came off the bench and he was like college basketball's biggest secret. A lot of people kept calling him that. So um, even if the Celtics don't take him, I think there's a very good chance somebody in the top 20 takes a chance on him because he's a very, very good player. Um, that's something I like uh, as far as going outside the top 10. Uh, I think there's a really good chance he, he goes, you know, I, I like that under a lot. Yeah, we don't have to focus, you know, on the top five, top three picks. It could, it could be anybody on the board, anywhere to that we think there's value on. And Gary, do you have anybody else that you think uh, on the board is going to go higher or lower than expected? Yeah. Uh, one guy I like um, just sort of his archetype as a player and, and how this type of archetype tends to get valued in the league, especially the last five, six years. Um, I just think there's going to be a GM willing to take a shot on Brandon Clark uh, higher than we might think. I, I know there's, there's, you know, some worries with some skill sets and some parts of his game, but I just think the way he can play defense, uh, the versatility he can show and, and the way he can almost play that positionless basketball that we value so much. Um, I, I think that's big. And I, he's a name too. You, you've really, not that this draft is because of the top heavy. I don't even know if it's top heavy, this draft, but uh, because of the lack of like star power in this draft, there's a lot of variance when it comes to mocks. Once you get past like the first five, six, seven picks, uh, but I've seen him as high as like 11. I've seen him as low as like 24. Uh, I just think he's going to end up on the higher end of that spectrum. And and even, even saying that though, uh, one of the bets I really, really like is amount of freshmen taken inside the top 10. Uh, the number's at five and a half right now. And if you want to get a sense of where that's trending, uh, it was minus 162 in the DraftKings Sportsbook yesterday to take that over. It's now minus 200, which I still think is fair for how relatively certain I am that this is going to happen. Uh, I mean, if we can see that the top six picks are going to be who we think the top six picks are, that's three freshmen right there. You've got sophomores in Culver and Morant um, and, and guys like that. But when you look at the final four picks of the round, you need three of them to be freshmen. And all the names we're hearing, I, I, it's hard for me to imagine that it's not some combination of like Cam Reddish Jackson Hayes, Kobe White, uh, you know, even if you want to put like Nasir Little in there as a guy who could possibly crack his way to the top 10, like the only way this goes wrong is if one or both of the Gonzaga guys are taken. Uh, I know the Wizards have been tied a lot to international prospects. Uh, his name's eluding me right now, but it's, it's the, French, the French kid. Uh, I've seen a lot at nine. Uh, That's a bet I like, the over 0.5 international in the top 10. For yeah, I, I feel like that's a pretty safe over. Like, I feel like at least one of those because there's well, he, probably be the guy. At least one of those get taken in the top ten. Uh, but then you would need like I don't know, like Walker Alexander to be taken. Like, there's there's just certain things that I don't think can happen. I think it's going to end up being like you said, Cam Reddish at eight. I think you're going to see Hayes inside the top ten, and I think you're also going to see Kobe White probably taken at seven. So I, I really like six freshmen to be taken in the first round. Yeah, I like Kobe White definitely to go in the top 10. I'm a big fan of his. I would be really surprised. Will seems very shocked about something, but uh, very surprised if uh, he didn't go in the top 10. So I, I think that make, bet makes a lot of sense. I think we should go to uh, splitting up our $500. And as champion, I'm, I decide I want to go last. You know, I think uh, that the champion should sit here and, and, and watch what you two, would you two get wrong and uh, wait until tell you what I'll get right. So, Gary, I'm going to let you uh, let you start it off. 
So we'll go back to those two baseball bets uh, I liked at the start of the show. Uh, I think those are solid, solid values. I'm going to put $50 on each one of those. So again, Verlander plus 120 to go over eight and a half strikeouts against the Reds. And then you've got, uh, uh, you've got, sorry, uh, Adrian Sampson. I'm even forgetting his name. That's how irrelevant he might be. You said nobody uh, knows who he is. We're betting on him. We barely know. Uh, exactly. You know, you bet the numbers, not the names. Uh, Adrian Sampson to go over four and a half strikeouts against the Indians. I just think that that heightened slider usage, super important. And we've seen the results in his last three starts specifically. So 50 bucks on each one of those. Uh, Sampson's plus 128. And then I'll put 150 on five and a half freshmen over at minus 200. And I will also put the last 150 on DeAndre Hunter under pick 5.5 at minus 110. Although I will say, uh, I like what Will said a lot about maybe just taking Hunter at plus 115 to be the fifth pick. That might actually make a lot more sense because a lot of my reasoning uh, for liking that under is just the ties he has to Cleveland at five. And maybe there's an off chance Cleveland makes a deal. They trade up to four so they can get the guy they want. So I think there's, it makes sense to just take under 5.5. Also, it's not, it's not a crazy decision either way. It's basically it's not a massive same. difference. Yeah. Yeah. Will, where are you going with your money? Are you going to finish in uh, third place again? Are you going to take me down? I think we may have lost Will Appleby, but uh, couldn't take the heat. Couldn't take the heat of your burns all, all the time. Couldn't take the heat of my burns. So we'll just go to my picks. Uh, he was going to lose anyway, so it, it doesn't matter too much. Um, I, I'm going to go two hundred dollars on Cam Reddish over pick seven and a half. I, I just think he goes eight to Atlanta or later. I don't really see a case for him to go in the top seven. Um, Kobe White, Darius Garland, Culver. Um, I, I think all these guys for sure go under Hunter is going to go before him as well. So I'd be surprised if Reddish went in the top seven, Darius Garland under five and a half. I'm going to go $200 on that. I really think Garland goes four. someone trades out for him, but if not, maybe Hunter goes four, like you said, and Garland goes five. I'll, I'll live with that. Um, and if he somehow he falls to six, I'll live with that too. But I, I really think there's a much higher probability. Somebody trades the number four takes Garland there. Uh, and the Pelicans get out of that draft spot that I think they they don't love. They, they took it because it's what the Lakers had, but I don't think they love that number four pick. And maybe that's why you heard rumors about them trading number to number two, but I don't think it happens. And, and Garland goes number four to somebody. And then lastly, $100 on Romeo Langford, under pick 16 and a half. Uh, I like the two, first two even more, but I want to diversify a little bit. And I think there's, you know, it's 65, 35 that he goes under 16 and a half on the pick. And yeah, I'll, I'll take that value in uh, every single time. So, Will, you are back on the podcast. Where are you going with your dollars? Well, uh, before I magically disappeared for a moment, I uh, I like my international bet. I'm going with $100 on that. Uh, $100 over 0.5 international players in the top 10 for minus 200. I'm taking 100 on Jarrett Culver to go fourth overall at plus 120. I'm Putting 100 on DeAndre Hunter to go fifth overall at plus 115. Uh, I'm putting another 100 on Camigelli to go under 22.5 for plus 120. Uh, I'm putting 50 on – Here's I'm doing a couple dart throws, you know, buying some of the rumor hype, hoping, hoping one of these hit. Uh, Darius Garland at third overall at plus 1,600. And 50 on R.J. Barrett under 2.5 for plus 1,400. Yeah, some of those are, are long shots at the end, but long shots happen every once in a while. We, we know that on this show, uh, Gary and Hidden Auburn to win the the region, and we've had some other plus 1,000s or more come through. So uh, I would say that those bets make a lot of sense. Will they hit? Probably not. They are plus 1,600 and, and plus 1,400 long shots, but I think there's you know, there is some value there. Again, I, I'm not going to recommend it, but I think that – it makes sense that one out of 15 times some crazy things have happened in the draft. I mean, Oh, they're definitely dart throws. I just want to emphasize that. They're yeah. definitely yeah. dart throws. I feel Nothing like, wrong with the dart throw again. I feel much better about the other four bets, but I mean, I get, I'm taking a shot. I got to catch you guys somehow. If there was one team though, Will, that you would think might be just dart throwing in their, uh, in their boardroom, sorry, their draft room. Who do you think it would be? It would be the New York Knicks. It would be the New York Knicks. So maybe they're like, ah, who do we take? We're actually going to throw a dart. And then Will's either correct or incorrect based on, They'll be, they'll be too busy trying to kick Charles Oakley out of the draft room because he's trying to get in somehow. And like, they won't call into the commissioner, and then something weird will happen where they just 
you know, they just they just pick whoever like the consensus twenty nine teams want to give them, like you would in a fantasy draft. Yeah, James Dolan's yelling at at a fan for for booing. They, who might boo the pick and, and changes everything. Who knows? Yeah, James Dolan on the way to the Knicks draft room on Thursday. Someone's going to like boo his limo going back and he's going to have his driver turn around so he can talk to the guy about it. He's not going to be there in time. Although I guess if Dolan's not there, the Knicks act more rationally. So we might not want that to happen. Who knows? Who knows? And uh, remember in the DK Sportsbook, the odds and lines are subject to change. See the website for actual odds. And if you or someone you know has a gambling problem and needs help, call 1-800-GAMBLER. But with that, we I think we had a successful podcast. I think we gave out a lot of good information. I'm excited for the NBA draft. Kind of wish, Gary, you got to enjoy your NBA finals a little bit. Uh, you know, your Raptors are picking 59th in the draft. I guess that's pretty irrelevant. They probably just- Well, we had a, uh, what was it? I think when the, the Anthony Davis trade went down like 40 hours after the Raptors won the NBA title and you already had people being like, this is the biggest trade of a superstar we've seen in the NBA <laughs> in years. And it's like, well, but Ka- Kawhi, Kawhi just won five. What? So the news cycle. You're you're just used to the news cycle at this point. And it's, hyperbole. We know Eric loves that. I, even I'm getting mad at the hyperbole. Will um, that, that, that's how bad it's gotten. But for Gary and Thornton, Will Appleby, I'm Eric Rosenthal, and for the DraftKings Sportsbook, we just went between the lines. <laughs>